So hello everybody, welcome to Sofa Broker, a dashingly wonderful new podcast hosted by myself, uh, Solly Strickland, and um, this person over here who will introduce himself, please. My name is Daniel McPeak, hello everybody. And uh, Daniel McPeak, let's start with you. Who are you? How did you get into real estate? Why are you here? Uh... Well, wow. okay. So, um, hi everyone. Welcome to Sofa Broke Up. Um, as Solly said, this is going to be a podcast about us talking about people that want to go through a journey of real estate. And that's pretty much how I got into real estate. Um, started out selling double glazing. That's White gold. <laughs> did, did, that for a, <laughs> did that for a while. Uh, and I, I mean a serious while, a good couple of years. And I was pretty good money. at it. Yeah. I was pretty good at it. Um, it was almost like the, a university was going on. Well, I left school early. So I was uh, 15 when I left school. Um, I did my GCSEs, but I didn't turn up to take them. <laughs> yeah. like, when you have to get, get there, because I, I didn't really want to do that. Um, yeah. I wanted to get involved quickly. And sales had always been a big passion for me. Uh, a, a side note, as a breaking point, I was massively into the psychology of sales as young as like 11. Mm. And I remember being around 12 and asking my mum, there was something at the day called Amway, right? Amway was a set of tapes. Proper old school. Yeah, that could teach you how to sell. And Amway used to sell like Tupperware. And, you know, it was like, you know, so it's pottery. Yeah. So they would, <laughs> they would make this stuff, this company Amway, they would deliver it to you. You would buy it on bulk and you would sell it on. But what they were really good at doing was teaching you mm. how to sell it on, how to make kind of money. Like Avon lady, Avon lady, yeah, exactly the yeah. same, yeah. And I, I asked one Christmas for some Avon, some Avon. <laughs> I asked one Christmas did. for some Amway tapes, and um, they turned up in August because my mum didn't realise it had to ship from the states, and it took forever. Back then, it was six months. It turned up, and I became obsessed with them listening to them and it taught me more about sales and people than I think going to school ever did and that's kind of where the passion for sales started and the the, the thing you and you was talking about you know that into you know double glazing yeah. that kind of industry at the moment and there was loads of people doing it and I, I used to make good money out of it and I always look back at them days now canvassing you know in the rain and when it's hot and doing whatever with a little pen in my hand, a notebook and knocking on people's doors and asking to prospect mm. to their face. I always look back at them years now and now I know I was actually going through my type of university where other people were going to uni and doing stuff. That was my, that was my, that I was learning on the job and that created a desire and a passion probably because I was looking at front doors all the time, <laughs> um, that, that led me into real estate. And I think that that has been solely responsible for me changing the career from double glazing into real estate was sales. Yeah. And it's the ability to be involved in sales. That's, so to, long answer yeah. short, that has always been the passion it's always been about sales. It just so happens that real estate yeah. is the highest price point I can get to. That's interesting because I come from, I ca we ca we've arrived at the same place, but in yeah. such such different. I mean, really different ways. And it's you know a lot of people talk about it and, and how different we are and yet how similar we are. And you know, obviously, uh, I did do my GCSEs and I did well quite done. well in them. You uh, did. I did. Uh, I did them at the the most famous school on the planet. Per chance, I haven't heard what school that is. Would you <sighs> mind? It's just not a it's not a great thing at the moment. But I, yeah, so I went to Eton. I did oh. eleven years at boarding school. Five of them at Eton. I was wow. pretty successful. I was very good at sport, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Terrible at um, at, at schoolwork. Really, really bad. Got my GCSEs, and then okay. by the time I got to my last year, I just I'd had enough. And I just didn't even bother turning up for my A level, so I was never going to go to university. Very rare for that school. I wasn't really? naughty. I was just like everyone else was going to Oxford, Cambridge, Bath, you know, St Andrews. I'm the top whack. And if they weren't, they're going to some sort of poly and just you know doing hospitality or something, you know, whatever it was. Um, I just just I had to leave. I'd, I'd been successful and popular and all that kind of stuff. And I talked about the, the the sports side of it. 
I played a lot of cricket, and cricket's quite relevant to right now, actually, with the Ashes that's just been going on. A, how entertaining it is, but B, the camaraderie of cricket. You know, 11 guys spending a lot of time to eat, together. No jokes about public school, please. Um, <laughs> but going through, going through a lot together uh, for a long time. You know, if you go and play an away game, you know, I was captaining quite a lot of teams. I was quite high up in the sort of, you know, vice You were tall. I was... <laughs> Shut up, will you? <laughs> um, but you know what? What it made me realise is that you know the power of communication. If someone's having a bad day, a yeah. teammate, you know, I think that's a really important thing. If you do it year after year after year with the same people, it, it's not too dissimilar from building a, a small company with someone and building a team. And that I think was really important to me. But how I actually got into into, the, into agency happened through, and why I'm relatively good at it. Um, it wasn't actually wanting to sell. I just found myself getting a essentially a telesales job, but really one of the coolest telesales jobs on the planet. Where was that? So my my dad rang me one day and said, what are you doing this summer? I said, oh, I've got a clue, father. I was like... Well, Is that how you talked back then? Because he was posh. Of course not. Did, did the, were you a little bit like <laughs> Margaret Thatcher? Did the poshness wear off as you got... I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I've been hanging out with you too long. Yeah, yeah. But Ooh. what I did, so I went to work at the Brixton Academy. I got a summer job. Just literally, just... Uh, everyone that, that's anyone. And it, the, this is a very strong note for Solly. This, Solly is a massive music fan. I'll let him it talk about it. It defines who I am, yeah, actually. Yeah. More than agency. And I think that, that you learn so much, I think, being involved in a, a role that took you... you know, how did it get on at the Brixton Well, Academy? I went there for a six-week job, cash in hand, and I left three years later. <laughs> and a lot of that is because, let's face it, the Brixton Academy between 1993 and 1996 was a pretty cool place to be. So right? the, the Brixton Academy is, it's, it's like a music venue, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's sadly closed down for tragic reasons. But at the time... Who were Red, some of the best people that would have played so I'd have there? So I'd seen the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Cypress Hill, Snoop Dogg, Orbital. I mean, it just goes wow. on. Primal Scream, Stone Roses, Smashing Pumpkins. Yeah. You know, sadly not Nirvana, my favourite band of all time. Kurt Cobain killed himself literally a month before the greatest shows of my life. Wow. Um, and that culminated actually with me leaving Brixton, not because I was so sad about Kurt, but they actually sold the, sold the venues quite soon after that. But what I did day after day, and this is what I'm coming to, day after day after day, I would pick up the phone as soon as they announced a gig, four nights, Red Hot Chili Peppers. That's 20,000 people buying yeah. tickets. Wow, they're it. not doing it online. Do you know what they're doing? They're seeing something in Melody Maker all the times and they're phoning a number. And that number went to me and four or five other people in a room above the stage at the Brixton Academy. That must have been I incredible times. So I would speak to, on an average week, thousands and thousands of people from all around the world, mainly UK, and some of them would, you know, if it was Bob Dylan fan, they'd go, hi, uh, I want to get four tickets for the man. And I'd go, snigger, 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 because obviously we're pretty snotty, punky, sound garden type, type people. But, you know, you'd get talking to them, or you'd get some, oh, hi, I want to come see the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And then you might think, ah, oh, this person sounded interesting. Let's see where this conversation goes once I've actually sold them four tickets for the Red Hot Chili Peppers or Pearl Jam or whatever. And so you just, you're almost sort of, very much like you, but this is this is on the phone. You were doing it in front of their, at their front door, but it's a similar kind of cut, a coal face of tr not. I wasn't trying to sell, and I think that really sums us up actually quite yeah, nicely. It does because you are the salesman. You're the you, you cut. Was it you cut their throat? And I I d tend to do a lot of that sort of nicey nicey talking. And you actually you, you guys won't know this, but five minutes before we started, I set up a uh, a listing appointment evaluation for Dan. You know, I did all the nice stuff. Oh, what a light sounds amazing. And Dan's going to go there and get the signature in five minutes. And that the way you got into this and the way I got into this, although very different, have led to, you know, I think a really interesting partnership that I think is really hard to replicate. I think we're really lucky. I think you're very lucky to have me. Um, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, it's, it, it's the first time I've heard you explain it like that. Um, it actually yeah. just come to me. Yeah, and... That makes a hell of a lot of sense. You know, I can, I can see it now. I can see us both, you know, separate to each other, doing something. But we was both coming towards, I think what the, the biggest takeaway is in with is we was learning how to speak to people. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, that's the, the biggest problem. I think you know. so. And we talk about this on the Academy a lot about how we are essentially, and I actually I do this in listing appointments, you know, we're, we're a dating agency. You know, we're not we're not actually selling 
the product that we're there to go and have a look at. You, you know, you say this to everyone who will listen. You know, we're selling ourselves, and you nobody knows that better than someone that's done a bit of white gold, right? In yeah. terms of you know what you were doing back then, and you know, it, I think it's really important that you know if you can pick up on someone and pick up on who they are quickly. You know, that's sort of job done. That's the dating edge. That's the peck on the, the metaphorical peck on the cheek, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's, it's really, I guess, getting the signature is a bit of a cliche thing to say, but. So that, um, so that, that brought us into it, right? So yeah. it, you, it took you from being on the Brixton Academy. So let's, Eat, let's Eaton, move into Eton Brixton Cluttons. Is right. Basic. And that's what I was going to do. So let's move it on to real estate. So you've moved on, you've done Eton, you've, you're at the Brixton um you're you're enjoying that but all of a sudden there's a there's a sea change into you going to cluttons right so why how and when (laughs) okay uh 96 i said kurt cobain had had, had died and and then brit pop was doing its thing and everything's a musical reference for me you know whenever i post on it girls to be boys that stuff all of that sort of stuff and whenever i post on instagram you know it's always got music with it and you know it's just it's lyrics define who i am and i think a lot of that is from talking to people the whole time on the phone thousands of people um lyrics are more important than music in my opinion um so yeah, it was you know, uh, Brixton Academy was sold. It had been a private and a wonderfully amazing private venture. Sold out to a big corporate Heineken, I think it was or Carling, and I didn't. It wasn't for me. So I then did the usual, you know, sloppy old Etonian, useless public school layabout. Just didn't know what to do. <laughs> um, I wasn't that bad. So my dad again rings me up. And goes, eh, well, you think you're doing anything? My dad was very successful, right? Self-made. Okay. Uh, and he says, so what are you what are you doing? I said, I just don't know. He said, well, have you thought about estate agency and i'm like what's that he said well you know when i used to go and have big long lunches back in the day and using i used to come home in a certain state and you i'd be with some bloke in a suit and a clipboard you know being all nice to me yeah well that bloke would normally be an estate agent and i was trying to tap them up through lunch to get some deals out of them Interesting. He said, do you want to do that i was like uh yeah okay where he said well one of my great friends is the managing uh, partner of a uh, senior partner of clanton's and he's got a really cool office. He's down by Tower Bridge. You'd really like it. Go and give it a go. Oh, hold on, hold on. The Tower Bridge. Yeah. So you would have been south of the river because north, <laughs> north of Tower Bridge, there's not, there's yeah. not much going. It's, there's a lot of Make people. The south. And there's a castle, right? <laughs> south, there's, hmm, let me think. There used to be London Dungeons along Tooley Street. And then there's, um, okay. oh, not much else. Okay. So okay, where, did, where so, was you? What where was you on the bridge? So self-proclaimed, Mr. East End. Not at all. Not Mr. at all. Just, e- just, just East End to be man. The right side of London. Okay. Uh, post-industrial warehousing on an epic scale, Mr. Uh, Hello London Lofts. So that's what I fell in. I fell in love with those buildings. But going that that sort of comes. You know, that's further down the line, and obviously that's how we met. Um, but with with the Clanton's thing, yeah. I, I just said, yeah, because I, I needed the cash and B, I just wanted, didn't want to let my dad down. You know, no, no one wants to let their dad down, do they? Stan, wherever you are. Um, so <laughs> I turn up at Clutton's, which I think at the time was the oldest, would be the oldest estate agency in the UK, like, the you know, the oldest. And what year? Was, what year is this? This is 96 and a half, maybe seven. So what do you, as, as someone that had been to Eaton Brixton Academy, <laughs> what? are you expecting to make because the end of the day right oh. you're, you're 97 yeah you want to make money yeah yep. you want to get out you want you, you want to be doing loads of gigs a week still oh and also a girlfriend had just dumped me for being a bit useless and she was quite ambitious a little bit chelsea posh all that kind of stuff yeah and i kind of a little bit inside of me was like mm, i want to i want to prove you wrong oh, i've done so, i've done the breakup cassette so she helped you along i think she did wow you should what, congratulations to this person for let's send, let's i think helping. you should send her a bunch of flowers I, I, I will let him do that, yeah. Um, but I think you should... Like, what... So, what's the meat and potatoes of it? Yeah. You're going in. You're going to go to Clutton's. We know yeah. where it is. We know that Clutton's is an estate agency. It's based in... It's, it's one of the offices is Shad Thames area yeah. of London. So, it's yeah. near Tower Bridge. How much money are you going to make? And how much money do you expect to make? Or mm. was you at that point yet where you just wanted cash? I just wanted cash. I knew it was going to be more than what I had before. And I knew my living standards were pretty much, the same. I mean, it was very basic back then, wasn't it? Yeah. Without wanting to sound too retro, but you know, I didn't have much in the way of overheads. It was really just beer money. And if I, you know, taking a girl out for dinner, you know, usual crap, yeah. quite frankly, when you're in twenties. And, um, 
I didn't, you know, and I wasn't wanting for a home or rent or anything like that. So for me, it was, I had to, it was really to do something. I knew there'd be money at the end of it. And I knew that in property, people made money because my dad drove really nice cars and had big houses. So I, I guess that was sort of in there. But I was, I was quite an altruistic kind of guy. You know, I'd been in music, so I wasn't really going there thinking, right, I want to make, you know, 60 grand this year or whatever. It was just, I want a job. And I, li- I knew so little about it that I actually turned up in a, I think it was a Soundgarden t-shirt and jeans. And this guy who's a friend of my dad's actually just said, get the fuck out of my office. And, you know, I, I, I literally was walking tail between my legs, no mobile phone to call anyone go, oh my God. I think I went to a phone box, rang my dad and said, I think I've just fucked up. <laughs> As it turns out, he then rings the office. Some office lackey comes running down with, a, with some cash and takes me down to Hayes Galleria. Right, yeah. Uh, nice. Buys me a suit, cheap suit, cheap uh, shirt, time, shoes and whatever. And I go back to the office and they give me a second chance. So, it, yeah, I went there because I wanted to do something. I knew there'd be money, but I didn't know how much. I had no concept yeah. of what it was. But I do know what my first year's salary was was if you if you Which are is, keen to know that year i made twenty four thousand pounds and that i mean that's interesting so again oh, and by the way i did ring that girlfriend and tell her and what did she say she said i'm amazed well done she was very cool about it actually but that's because the breakup tape i sent her was epic you sent a break the best tape. music anyone's ever been sent so just for point for for people that might be listening to this that are a little bit younger <laughs> yeah well um, what What's is a, a breakup tape uh, okay, do you know what, a, young people out there, if you're on Instagram, <laughs> hashtag cassette. And a tape is something that you... You put it into a machine, usually you that What do you put on it? Uh, you put music on it. Oh, yeah. and so you yeah. censor that? Yeah, so you get one tape. So did you, you put, email it to her? Or? <laughs> uh, that's a really good question. How did I give it to her? Okay, got there. So, you know, so that's interesting. So you've come, so you've, you've ventured into the world of estate agency and you're in there. And you're doing it. And I was very similar. So, you know, we, I had been... Oh, no, you got, sorry, you got the GTI story, haven't you? Yeah, I'm just, yeah. So uh, uh, what happened was I was doing, selling double glazing and um, one of my friends contacted me and said, you know, if you work for this guy, which was on the Isle of Dogs, um, they'll give you a Golf GTI. <laughs> and I was like, well, at the moment, I haven't got a company car. Okay, what year is that? Uh, I, I don't know, early. Well, what Mark Golf was it? Um, Mark T? No, it was it was a Mark it was a Mark Three, so Dragon Green Love Mark it. Three. Oh, with a, was it was it the big bumper model? <laughs> yes, like the ones that Yuppies yeah, used yeah, to yeah. drive. Yeah, it was it yeah. was a Yuppie mobile, yeah. and I I was given this, and I was like, okay, this is interesting. So I took that because I just didn't have a car, and now I've got now I had a car, and and I was young, and I wanted a car, and I wanted it to be a Golf GTI, and it wasn't. It was fairly new, and it was fairly cool. Um, bearing in mind I wasn't being driven around in my dad's latest <laughs> Bentleys or, you know, Ferraris or anything uh, like uh, that. Uh, 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 and, and, he and, didn't buy a Ferrari, but an Aston Martin because the Ferrari wouldn't stop. Yeah, well, so, ev- <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have none of that, right? So everything had to come, um, had, had to be produced. And that was interesting. So I started working as an estate agency on the Isle of Dogs for a guy um, that owned Romford Dog Track um so where we used to race dogs yeah where where you used to where, race where dogs we I, used to not I, you no, oh, we, yeah we did have dog there, yeah so um you know and i started there and i went there and someone in a similar story to you i went in for an interview so i had to go see someone and back in the day it was a legend called um dobrin ian dobrin he was the guy that dobrin. sorted everyone out jobs so he was the what do you call him what would you call him recruiter the recruiter yeah. yeah so i went to see him so my mate said you know do you want a job and i said yeah um he went well go see ian dobrin here sort you out so i went to see ian dobrin in Loughton. went and see him and he went yeah i can put you with this guy you know i'll get you golf gti you just need to turn up and speak to him and talk about stuff so i was like great so i went to see this guy and i thought you know because my mum had recently bought me a nice jumper i thought i'd wear a, a pair of jeans and a nice jumper and um, you know, so we're what, both idiots. What, 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 <laughs> so I turned up in this, and to be honest, he didn't mention anything. They were, you know, from from the right side of the river, so they knew not just to throw me out. Um, so they listened to what I had to say. And uh, when I left there, I I got an a call back from Ian Ian Dobrin, and he said to me, "Look, yeah, they they like you, they want you, but can you put a suit on <laughs> and not turn up in a jumper?" And I was like quite like that jumper (laughs) and he was like change it so i changed it you know and i got there and i remember two things about my first day 
as an estate agent on the Isle of Dogs in E14. One, um, no one told me how to get home. So the day I was leaving, when I was leaving, they, th- this is the second part, they gave me a car. They said, here's your car. It actually turned out to be a Fiat Bravo. Mm. It wasn't a Golf GTI at uh, that point. I was a bit annoyed about that, but it was the new one. So, you know, hey, and I'm thinking, you know, I've been allowed into this place where, you know, you can sell property and their stuff. So I was very G'd up. I was really excited. Can I just say company car? Yeah. You know the reference. Yeah. I was, yeah, I was really excited. And then um, I remember I was leaving, about to leave at the end of the day. And I said to the manager, um, Mike, his name was, I won't say his full name. And uh, I said, how do I get home? Like, what's the way off the island? And I remember he looked at me, still faced, and said, well, no one told me. Oh. And that was my baptism of fire Wolf of Wall Street, into yeah. real estate. And I looked at him, and I was like, oh, a lot of words I could say at the moment. And they just <laughs> walked off. They got in their cars. They left. And I was in this car thinking, okay, um, I've got to find a bridge so I can get off the <laughs> island. And I ended up the wrong way of the river coming back to the Dartford Tunnel on the opposite side and ended up at the M25 there. And I do not know how it happened. But what I do know, the whole time I was smiling because I was in a brand new car. Love it. And there was blokes next to me and they wasn't. right. And that was the beginning of real estate. And that is why, and I think you would say this as well, we, we fell into it. Yeah, totally. It didn't, yeah. we wasn't... Well, at school, you know... Yeah. You, at school, you know, if someone said, what do you want to do? You're not going to go, I want to be an estate agent. You want to be Superman or a lorry driver or something. Yeah, or my youngest kid wanted to be a penguin. You know, you're not going <laughs> to, you're not going to, but you're not. Not many people will put their hands up and say, I, you know, I want to be an estate agent. But I think, I think that only happens in hereditary firms. You know what I mean? Yeah. So if it's something in Sons, you know, I, I don't know anyone in the industry. Like if I think, think about my early mentors at, at Clutton's. Actually, interesting. The guy that was the main boss, it was hereditary. His his dad had been it had been in it, but the other guy was exactly the same as us. Exactly, he was a bit of a rogue. Yeah, great gift to the gab. Didn't mind getting his knuckles knuckles bloody if he had to get a deal across the yeah. line, and drank like a fish. You know. So, and I'm sure I'm, I know you'll agree with this, but today, in today's terms, and kids that are out there today, and I say kids a lot when I talk about brokers, but you know, I mean people up to the age of, of forty five um because a lot of the stuff we do on the academy has has older people on it and younger people i agree i think you know there's a sea change there's kids as young as like you know getting into real estate or the the opportunity Mm. to hear about real estate from people that have made a a lot of money because fundamentally if you want to make a load of money in this world on this planet and you want to do anything and you ask everybody what should I do? They will say, get into property. Yeah. You know, that's a guaranteed way in. And I think we talk about that a lot on the academy, but I think that's the difference. You know, we're seeing kids pre-uni, uni age, you know, don't know what to do, doing stuff, actually listening to things like this podcast and stuff about real estate. Yeah. And, you know, wouldn't you... Wouldn't you want to now, if you was our young age, wouldn't you want to have had what we'd had available, if we'd had stuff like that, to listen to that stuff and get involved with it? Yeah, I mean, on, on your point about young people wanting to get into it, and I know there's a, this whole thing about, you know, my portfolio and all that kind of stuff, which yeah. I, I love seeing 21-year-olds on Instagram talking about their portfolio. Yeah, it's, I know, it's, it's hilarious. Um, but more pertinent to us is actually being a broker and getting into being a broker and not an estate agent. That's another thing, of course. We'll touch on that. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, I spent most of 2020 and 2021 just endlessly on WhatsApp video calls, Zoom calls, one-to-one with people. And I'm seriously, between, from 18, we had a 17-year-old on the academy, right? From 17, typically 18, 19, 20, mid-20s, people from all walks of life, seriously all walks yeah. of life. I was talking to people from Bangalore who were 40 and <laughs> lo- people from South London in, who were 18. and just so Everyone just, is now getting into this real estate These people, journey. they've seen, they've got so much there for them to see. They just don't know what to do next. Do you go and do an intern or a summer job at one of the established 
agencies okay or do you just think well hold on i'm entrepreneur i've got other business interests i've got my portfolio dreams you know i've got a coffee shop or whatever it is they do and i'm not saying that tongue-in-cheek i these these are this is a generation of people who want to do stuff not not one thing yeah they don't want a gold watch after 40 years in a factory thanks very much they want to do lots of stuff and put their stamp and personality and their instagram and their socials into their business you know, obviously they're going to come to us. You know, that, that's a given. So I spent, I've spent the, really the last two or three years one-to-one with a lot of these people. And just the most wonderful thing about it is how they've, you know, received the brand, how they've received the way I speak to them and you speak to them as well yeah. sometimes. And, and more importantly, what do they do next? And it's, you know, we've named this podcast after what they've really done. Let's face it. Sofa they've, Broker. They've done Sofa Broker. What's they've got? Sofa is what they're doing at the moment. It's what we're doing right now. Broker's on the other end. What's the bit in the middle? It's our academy, you know? And yeah. I, it's, for me, it's, and I've, you and I have sold a lot of property between us. It must be a thousand, I would have thought. And some of it's beautiful over the last 20 odd years. This is, sing, without doubt, the best thing I've ever done in, in, in my real estate career is taking these people who were just a crazy phone call, my dining table during the pandemic with the kids flying around. They're in, you know, they're working at Joe and the Juice in Clapham, you know, fresh out of school or whatever. And six months later, you know, they've you know, after having done our academy, done the course, learned from you and me and all of that kind of stuff. Very much in the way that we speak now, actually. It's not all trainee trainee. I think, you know, I don't want to I'll pick it up actually, because some of these guys are now on a huge major T V show. They, you know, they are on a, on you a major at, We can name, show, what, three or four of those people who are on Crazy Rich Agents. Well, if you take take uh, an example of you, you, sh- you should speak about it. You know, one of the agents that are working for us now that started doing the academy, you know, who's, who's, who's giving the stepping stones to be able to engage to do what we're doing, they started earning money while they was at school, right? That's Toby Madden, right? It's what? I mean, to- Toby was doing his finals joined us did the academy sorry did the academy joined us and i think he actually completed a sale maybe a week or two before his his fi- his finals actually or he got his his last exam i'm not sure i didn't go to university uh <laughs> but either way a crucial moment in his educational career he completed a sale and i think it was at 3.75 million pounds yeah. having done our academy and if that doesn't tell someone who's out there thinking what should i do next Nothing else will. It's an ast- that is an astonishing story. We have Lindsay up in the northeast, and I think you should talk about Lindsay actually because you- I think yeah, we're, but I'd, we'll get back to Lindsay. I yeah. think another point, but maybe she'll come on. Toby, now, Toby's yeah. an example of the generation of people now that are coming forward into yeah. real estate and that are desperately seeking advice and guidance. You know, from people that are doing it, that are actually out there, that are long in the tooth, that know what they're doing and are willing to sit down with these younger boys and girls, you know, and give them the time of day. You know, it's something we've always been passionate about. You know, we didn't do this academy to set out to make a bunch of money. We did out. We did it to be passionate about what we do. And we believe in real estate. You know, we love it. Wherever we watch it, wherever it it takes us around the world, however we get involved in it in terms of what the property's like, we love real estate. I think you said something with, with, with true passion. And I think also going right back to the beginning of what, you know, how we got into this and our, and our different backgrounds and how we got into it and how it sort of gelled into this being that we are, um, you know, I think we are, because of the way we are, we're a little, we are disruptive. We're a little bit naughty. You know, we, we don't really go to, I mean, I Definitely. probably should be, you know, I, Clutton's, you know, I'm 50 years old. I, if it was 25 really? years later when I was, Chris, you, you look know, very, was, someone actually said I look 42 the other day. I was, it was the best day of my life. <laughs> anyway, it was sad, isn't it? Anyway, but you know, if, if I'd carried on being Mr. Joe normal and no disrespect to agency at all, yeah, I know you know, so. this is not about that. You know, I'd probably be that senior partner. I'd be, you know, doing doing that normal thing. But there is something in our upbringing and the way that we were and how we got into this business that says, no, we want to bring through kids who have not, who have nothing or kids who've got everything, but they've got something, you know, something's gone wrong in that. No, that sounds too charitable. I don't mean it like that. We just want to see different people doing this amazing career. You know? Yeah, I mean, I think... We see, we're seeing it happen now and it is time for, you know, it is time for kids to learn about real estate. It is time for kids to become estate agents because it is the thing that makes the world the most money. 
And that's real estate. That's what happens. And this is why you should, you know, shut up and listen to what we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching this episode of Sofa Broker. Remember to follow us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Amazon, and wherever else it is you get your um, podcasts. Uh, Why are you looking at me? Uh, tic -tac -tic -tick -tick TikTok. Is there a TikTok? TikTok? What's TikTok? It a tic no, it's what is that the fast that one? one. No, what is that one that you get where, that everyone's, the kids are on? This is embarrassing. Should we stop talking about yeah, social okay, media? Yeah, okay. Um, thanks, guys. <laughs>